So welcome to this uh, virtual interim second of the series. Uh, today we discuss mostly new proposal for blockwise transfer and related work started some time ago uh, on non-traditional responses. And as first main item, in fact, we have a presentation from John and Mohammed on the new draft. Okay, well, I'll um, start by doing that. Screen. Uh, the audio is not great. <clears throat> I, yeah, I, I don't know quite why that is. Um, it's good now. Thank you. Better, yeah. right, maybe just move the thing. Okay, so um, this essentially is to talk about uh, some of the challenges that we had within the uh, the DOTS environment, the distributed denial of service threat signaling type environment. And we came up with the fact that uh, when we're working within networks that are potentially lossy because of the DDoS attacks, uh, some of the existing co-ops stuff that's in place there, uh, we need to look at and modify. So, um, so here we just have uh, kind of a schematic diagram of where we have uh, a use case or other ones as well, where we have a client at the end of an internet pipe of the internet, and we have some sort of upstream server dot server who communicates with the dots client on the local device and provides mitigation services based on information that's passed back and forth. And so essentially, where the application is using CBOR across CoAP across DTLS. And by and large, in that when the client says, I need help, he will send it as a non-confirmable mitigation request. And the server periodically can update the client with what's going on, again, with non-confirmable stuff, primarily because the inbound pipe may be overloaded due to a DDoS attack. So with that kind of scenario, in the normal circumstances, we can handle stuff. The client still can request mitigations, and hopefully the mitigation service is then able to kick in and control this, the traffic down the pipe so that the pipe is then back into a normal user to user type of environment. Um, uh, sorry, John, maybe allow me to interrupt, please. Uh, is it possible to have the audio just a bit better, maybe getting closer to the mic? Because right now it's a bit wavy and, and I cannot really capture everything on the minutes. Okay, is that any better? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just move the microphone. Yep, apologies for that. Okay. Um, so the general kind of operation for DOTS is that for configuration, we actually use confirmable co-op, and this is done in the peacetime when there is no attacks taking place. But for the actual mitigations and responses, everything has to be non-confirmable, as I mentioned before. And we have found that in the general case that a single packet contains all the necessary information. So a mitigation request can be in the packet or some sort of status update coming back from the service can be in a single packet. And we have found and have done testing that this works fine with packet losses. It just is that the client may not see some of the information getting back. Um, to make the protocol uh, robust, we have what's known as application heartbeats, which do some sanity checks of what's taking place. And through the way that we've done it, the server component out in the internet is able to identify that the client is always alive, even if there's traffic loss, but the client may just have to carry on blind, assuming that the server is still there. We then come to want to extend the capability of just a simple mitigate help me type request, and this is what we're doing type response to uh, telemetry. So it could be that the local client is relatively smart and is able to identify why traffic coming in is causing problems. And so is then able to send some sort of telemetry information about what he's perceiving the attack is upstream to the server to enable the server to better mitigate what's taking place. Likewise, the server can send back information about how it's mitigating the attack, what type of attacks it's, it's seeing, and so on. And uh, the consequence of this telemetry information is that we're going to be larger than what can fit into a single packet. In the environment without a packet loss, um, block one and block two work perfectly for sending the stuff up to the server and getting the information back. With a non -confirmable. If it was confirmable, um, it works, but if there's any packet loss, we're into retries and so on. But typically with packet loss, um, block one's response saying, give me the next one gets lost, with the server coming back to the client, or the server when he's sending block two's downstream, um, the, the, the packet uh, gets lost and there's no way, easy way of recovering for that. And what basically happens within the environment 
is that everything kind of grinds to a halt whilst we're waiting for things to happen. It's just not acceptable when we're under sort of DDoS attack type of environment. So we've been looking at several ways of handling oversized packets. One way is just to use IP fragmentation so that instead of just a co-op message fitting into a single packet, we let it uh, go into multiple packets and just uh, send the whole data and assume that all the fragments are going to make it, but we have no way of recovering from missing fragments. Um, another way is that the application breaks up the telemetry data into chunks of data that fit into individual packets and send those. Um, the, we have a bit of a challenge there because the Yang any data requires that each individual chunk to be full JSON in its own right. So we then have to look at how can we break the telemetry data down into individual fully blown JSON chunks. And then we, we can do that into lots of very small chunks, but we want to actually minimize the number of chunks or packets being sent uh, so that uh, you know we maximize uh, the usage of any individual packet that could be there. Um, using block one and block two, we, we found has limitations, as I alluded to before, the performance is that um, if you're sending a block two from the server back to the client, uh, the server has to send the next thing, then the client has to request the next packet. So we're, we've got um, inter-packet latencies taking place as we've got turnaround times and all the rest of it. And we fall apart when we're in a lossy type environment, when the pipes are running full, when there is a serious DDoS attack that's taking place. So out of that, uh, we then thought, well, let's propose options, uh, block options three, and block option four, which work in the same similar sort of way as block one and block two, but there's several additions. One is that we can send all the block threes serially one after another up to uh, the upstream server, or likewise, the server can send all the block fours with some sort of major stated message. You can just send them down serially down the pipe as if we were sort of doing it with fragmented packets, they all just immediately follow one after another. But if we're going to be using block three and block four in a confirmable environment, then we obviously need to increase end start, which is slightly uncharted territory. Um, additions to block three and four is that we can request missing blocks. So if we're missing some data, some packet hasn't got through, we can re-request it. And so that we can make sure that the blocks that create the body of the entire chunk of data that's to be passed down, uh, we've come up with using a block ID for reassembly. But, um, has been a bit of discussion about using ETag, but we're not entirely sure whether we can use ETag because it is a resource local identifier. So there's a question mark in our mind whether ETag would work instead of having this block ID as part of the block three, block four packets. Um, so just looking at some of the block one versus block three. Block one, um, we are limited to probing rate. So if we're just sending them out and there's no response because the pipe coming back towards us is running full, we're limited to that probing rate of one byte a second, which is, um, for whatever reason, is, is quite a low rate. So we'll be hanging around for some time doing stuff. So it'll take time for telemetry information to be passed that. Whereas block three, we would say is subject, the whole body, the whole block of, or the set of blocks of rather, data are subject to the probing rate. So it means that we can just do a quick blat and everything gets to the other end, and then we have to go back into the probing rate type stuff. Um, both block one and block three can utilize uh, the 408 uh, missing blocks, you know, the entity's not complete type stuff, but we would need to extend the message that's in the response of the 408 either with um, the data body having this is the array of what's missing, or uh, we just include in the 408 response the fact that we've got block threes and we, we've seen these blocks and we haven't seen those, those other type blocks sitting in there. So we just try to work out ways of getting around that. And that's is what we've kind of loosely documented in the draft text. Likewise, with block two versus block four, um, the server has to wait for the next block request before we can send the next block down. And this, we have to maintain a copy of the body up in the server for a period of time. Whereas with block four, the entire set of blocks can be sent without waiting, hence giving a highest performance, highest, highest kind of transfer time just to get the data in between. And likewise, as we mentioned with the block one stuff, the client can indicate multiple blocks are missing, and the server can delete a body on select successful receipts and so on. So we can do some sensible management there. And um, thinking about this, it makes sense to us 
uh, to non-co-op experts that caches can keep the data at the block or the body level uh, for ease of caching should it be required. We have a challenge with tokens in how um, they should be used or not used as the case may be. So um, essentially is that you know, token matches a response uh, to the request so that the client can work out what this particular message that's come back and hit him is with. If we're going with the block three, block four type stuff, the tokens, there is no more additional client requests going upstream with the block four because all the block fours are coming back. So do we use the same token across all the block four responses that match, make up that big body? Or do we have different tokens or whatever? Um, it's just is the tokens intended to be a client local. In other words, it's under the control of the client. So the server has to send some stuff back. So we've got kind of question marks about uh, what to do with tokens and tokens. And likewise, um, are there any implications in proxies that we haven't yet thought about? Um, we also, which we haven't got into the draft document, anything to do with uh, RFC 8613, which we need to think about. Um, I'm guessing just mark it up that these are similar to block one and block two, i.e. both E and U are set. So that was a kind of overview of what's taking place. We have some questions that we haven't quite got answers to. Is there any sort of comments one would like to make? I have a bunch of comments, um, but um, if, if someone else has one, um, I might not st stop talking for some time. So maybe I'll put myself at the end of the queue. Go ahead, Christian. Um, I think, yeah, Carsten? Carsten, we can hear you. Carsten, the audio, we, we still don't hear you, sorry. Um, shall we, I mean, this, Christian, maybe you can start and then uh, Carsten just jump in whenever okay. the audio is fixed. Okay, um, then uh, maybe let's start with the, with the, one of the, the smaller items. Um, on the on the e tag, um, I don't quite understand um, what the issue about the the identifier being resource local um, would be. I understand resource local to mean that this identifier is scoped to the that resource. That is, um, it can't be re reused between resources, but that's not something that should impede this particular use case. So from my perspective is that um, it's something under the control of the server. Um, he is generating the e-tag and it's conceivable that the e-tag may be the same for a different set of body blocks. In terms of how, you know, if you compute it and if you're using some sort of weak algorithm to compute it, it's conceivable that the e-tag may be the same for different sets of blocks. I think that's precisely what it says that the, the, the e-tag should not be. And in those cases of hash collisions or something like that, where it would be, I wonder how the block ID would be any better here. Um, okay, so the proposal in the draft document is that the block ID is incrementing. Um, so for each new block set of body or body set of blocks that are sent back, we'll have a new block ID, which is incrementing every time a new body is sent back. Yes, that will recycle around in time. It could be a very long time. But that's something that could just as well be done with an e-tag if the server is insists that it, um, if, if the server wants to have use this particular model. Sure, I I, I accept that it, it could be done the e-tag and it could be cycling around. Um, yeah. Um. 
Then on a on a on a more general level, um, did you have a chance to read my mail uh, that I sent this morning on the on the more on the whole topic? Um, I didn't see one this morning. I saw a copy of an email that you sent out early on in the week because uh, I wasn't in I wasn't included in the the list of uh, people being sent to. So I don't know if there's another one you sent this morning. Let me check briefly. Nine. Okay, so I'm um, sorry, I, I, I mixed things up. Yes, uh, it the, the, what, that mail was a bit earlier that week. Um, the, this morning's mail was just kind of taking taking the thoughts from there on, um, but I think that wouldn't affect this discussion too much. Um, so my impression of this overall thing is that. All of this can be done uh, without um, without without kind of changing the whole block system by um, partially by mechanisms that are somewhere else in the pipeline and partially just by finding concrete um, kind of doing co doing concrete extensions without um, blocking things on on proxies that would be processing it. So, for example, if you if you could um, go to the yeah. Um, Right here it is on the missing blocks. Be uh, re-requesting. This should be for the for the block three case or the block one case. This should be quite straightforward. If there is just a response sent by the server that indicates which blocks are missing at the point in time when it um, when it comes to processing the um, processing that put. So if it, if that is supposed to be done in an atomic fashion. Then the so sure we would need to define a media format that says um, this is a reason for a failure to reassemble um, to to act on a message and it indicates how it what parts are missing, but with that inform um, that could easily be packed into a CBOR array or any um, CBOR array is probably the most straightforward could be defined as a new media type and then just sent back with a block one and I think that would then catch most of the block one cases that uh, of the block one problems that I mentioned so far. Yeah, sure. Okay, so from your email that I read earlier this week, um, the slide I've got up at the moment just talks about it being a 408, which is what you were referring to. Just is the question is how do we uh, include it? And okay, yes, it could be another CBOR. Uh, uh, Jon, sorry, Jon, the audio is uh, really choppy, really hard to follow, at least for me on the minutes. If you could just get the microphone a bit closer because sometimes it's pretty good. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, that's okay. No, I just um, why I'm so quiet on the microphone. I apologize, but okay. So yeah, just is that yeah in the uh, the email that I saw earlier this week from you, Christian, I, uh, which is why on the slide that I have now got up here, we talked about the 408 for the missing blocks, which could be some Seaboard embedded stuff, which is um, how we can handle the block one stuff. Um, but my real challenge also is how we do the block two. And you didn't really come up with alternative methods for block two. You only really came up with alternative methods for block one. Appreciated and worth certainly seriously thinking. About. Well, for for block for block two, it's um, it's, it, I think it's, it's it's really not that different from 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 what block four does. Um, the main point is to get the server to send the blocks on mass in the first place. And the the token issues that you are stumbling on is, is kind of the, the linchpin where this will all resolve around because this is this is the the tricky part. And um, how however we resolve that, for example, by using non traditional responses, um, that then the client receives the list of all blocks that it um, that are there and can just get the get the ones that it's missing in a second round. Sure, I understand that. Okay, so, but what I, I guess what partly concerned me was uh, we are potentially changing the semantics of block two, which is that a response is sent, then the client requests the next one, and then another response is sent, and so on. And we're changing it to sending them all out in one go somehow. And does that affect um, the appropriate RSC? Do we need to kind of say this is a modification of that RSC, or do we come up with a option which effectively does what the block two does 
but with some enhancements. So I, I, I don't even think that this so much needs to be an, an extension to block two, but more to the general token mechanism and then be a very lightweight or even absent indicator that, yeah, and please send me more blocks if you have any. Sure. Well, it, certainly the, the server needs to know somehow that instead of sending block to one by one by one, as is requested, yeah. he's going to have to send them by a block. So there needs to be a negotiated agreement that he's able to do that. So he's able to send them all in one go. Yes. And uh, Such so we, we in, again, in our draft have said that if the client initiates the get request using block four, then the server, if he understands block four, is able, he knows that he's a, it is safe for him to send all the block fours as a big watch. Yeah. Yeah, but that kind of, that, that still leaves us with two mechanisms where I think that one that has a sl small extension um, can, can suffice here. And that one mechanism uh, and that extension could be generally used for for other purposes just as well. Um, Carsten? Carsten, we can still hear you. <laughs> Uh, Christian, you can resume. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, just picking the. So I th I think that if if we combine all those those building building blocks that we have or might have if we if we continue on on the non traditional responses, then the only thing that remains is that we could that we would not have a mechanism for um i missed many blocks and precisely i need this and that and that and that one so is this something that you expect frequently to happen because the examples that you had in there um all were about bursts of missing blocks yeah i um at near pipe full conditions it's conceivable we may randomly miss several blocks and have the ability to re-request the missing blocks. It is, it, it certainly is a possibility. I agree that in the really flooded condition that with certainly with block fours coming back downstream to the client, we're likely to miss all of them. Um, and certainly within the draft we have uh, that is up to the client as to whether he decides to re-request missing blocks or just say, okay, well, there's just too much of a loss going on here. Let's just carry on and um, Wait for the next set of data to come in my direction. Yeah. So does anybody hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, you reconnected, reconnected me. So just just uh, for everybody's amusement, uh, Michael Richardson has found out that if you are on the internet, WebEx doesn't work. You need to be behind a net. And uh, I, I didn't remember that I was on the internet when I started the call. So, yeah, very, very interesting. So what, what I was suggesting was that, that maybe we can structure this discussion in, into a number of items, and I may not be catching all of them. But uh, one big item, of course, is congestion control. And uh, we, we need to understand uh, what we are doing here. And maybe a meta item behind that is, are we doing something that, that is very specific to dots? So are, are we kind of ignoring that there might be other applications that have uh, similar, applica uh, similar requirements for their application? Um, or are we trying to build something general that will work in, in other places? Because with dots, of course, the the... The idea of applying congestion control to the, to a DDoS situation is is uh, never going to work well. So uh, we we probably have to build something that ac actually actively cuts through uh, excessive uh, congestion. So that that makes the the solution probably look different 
for, from uh, solutions that are generally applicable. So that, that's one thing or one and a half things. And uh, the other question, of course, is uh, what is the, the proper way to extend uh, the co-op model here, which was not designed to be optimized for, for performance in, in the block situation. And uh, so far, the, the general idea has been if you need performance for large objects, then run co-op over TCP. But th there are good reasons why we don't want to do this here as well. Uh, which is maybe another observation that, that uh, uh, we are designing something here that, that um, is somewhat specific uh, to what, what DOTS uh, does. And uh, getting some progress on the non-traditional responses, that would be actually, actually, actually be great. Uh, so we would have uh, something coming from this which is generally uh, applicable and can be used in other situations than dots, maybe with uh, some congestion control added. Do you want me to kind of respond to that? Or Med, do you want to make a comment? Yes, please. But maybe the, the whole work group has an opinion on that. But I'm sure interested in your opinion. OK, so um, I yeah, totally agree that there's some very dots specific type stuff here uh, because of the potentially nasty environments that we work in. But I do think that will be other people using UDP where there are potentially lossy, lossy networks where there is an occasional um, packet that gets dropped. Um, this is one of the reasons why we perhaps use UDP so that we don't care too much if something gets lost. Um, you know, like the, the old IP fragmentation challenges is that you always got nine out of 10 packets, but you missed the 10th in a, an environment that um, was giving problems for whatever reason. Um, so, from that perspective, having the ability to um, send more data quickly uh, so we can get it over an environment, uh, I, I think it's a more general case than DOTS, but I agree that it's certainly generated by what DOTS is doing. Again, with DOTS, TCP is virtually a no-no uh, because you just now into, if there's any loss at all, TCP goes into recovery, things slow right down and can potentially just give up cannot afford to have the client choking on a TCP connection uh, saying I want to be able to mitigate something because TCP stack layer is not working. Yes, we have TCP within dots, uh, but it's a, it is a backup rather than the primary use, which is UDP. Yeah, so to, to get this by the ISG, we probably have to make sure that uh, we don't sell this um, Hey, if you want uh, to to do something aggressive, ignoring congestion control, then Coab is your the protocol you want to choose. Um, even though it is exactly that uh, here, but uh, I think we have to be a, a bit careful here on trends for for people with raw stuff on a spit. Certainly, from a dots perspective, we want to obey all the probing rates and all the rest of it. Um, the individual bodies of messages should be subject to congestion control so that we don't overload the circuits. It just is that we need to get a larger chunk of data, uh, well, larger body of data made up of chunks uh, moving in a direction at any one time. But that body would be subject to things like probing rate and so on, uh, which is absolutely right. Otherwise, we just uh, we'll create a DDoS attack in its own rights just by using the DOTS protocol aggressively sending too much data down the pipe. That, that's confusing so, me. Um, go ahead. That's confusing me because um, if if DOTS gets um, licensed to send arbitrary amounts of packages, um, ignoring the probing rate, that sounds much more complicated to me rather than 
just stating that for this particular situation, the probing rate is this and that, and that might be higher than the or the kind of default probing rate co-op specifies if, in case you don't know any better. So so how, how is this better than no probing rate at all? Um, it's, it's the, so you have a, a set of blocks which can provide the body, which is three or four packets. That entity is allowed to be sent and then the, when the next entity wants to come along to be sent, it is subject to the probing rate. Which currently is one byte per second, which is quite low, but that's another story. Yeah, but couldn't you just increase the probing rate if kind of if if you want the bunches of four by uh, four packages to go through in in one go by a factor of four, and then just um, and still respect the probing rate on average, but still send them as a burst? Uh, we I think the probing rate is meant to be followed on average and not kind of on a, on a, on a, on a byte per byte level. Okay. Then, yeah, then the, then the probing rate uh, as an average, yeah, we, we would adhere to that because we certainly do not want the DOTS protocol to create a, a, a DDoS attack in its own rights. Absolutely not. Yeah, again, I think we need to, to consider the two directions uh, separately. So the, the direction that is uh, subject to DDoS at the moment, um, you essentially need license to cut through. There is no way to, to do this in a TCP-friendly uh, way or something. So um, jumping probing rate to a high number while this is going on might be a way to do this. Still, you don't want to send your packets faster than, than your link is. So that, that there is, uh, maybe it's possible to remember something like, like a good uh, rate and, and use that as a probing rate. In the other direction, um, we, we don't have uh, a DDoS going on. So um, I think there is still some some incentive to do this in, in a friendly way, even though it's uh, certainly priority uh, traffic in, in a certain uh, sense. But it, it never makes sense to, to send packets at a higher rate than the network can actually transport it. So th th that's why you need congestion control, even if you are alone uh, on, on a, a particular uh, path. So getting something going there would be nice, but then uh, congestion control needs feedback. So how do we get feedback if, if the packets are lost in, in the other direction? I think that's, that's an interesting question. Is, is there a good way to get uh, feedback for, for the direction away from the DOS uh, uh, network uh, that, that allows us to, to do this at the, the uh, highest rate that uh, makes sense congestion-wise? It's a way of detecting at the um, case of this up here, the client end, detecting that there's a, a loss of traffic coming down the pipe from as part of the DOTS protocol. From there, he can then provide some sort of feedback outbound saying, I am losing this amount of traffic. Um, that would be a telemetry item that we'd add to the protocol. But that isn't, again, in the general co op environment an application specific thing to make sure it's going back the ability to be able to give feedback to saying that the traffic coming down the pipe inbound from the internet to the cloud there is a loss and we have a way of indicating that loss back up and that that could be a co-op option in its own right talking about some sort of determined loss if you wanted that kind of thing I suppose that could even be part of the telemetry that you're sending and would not need to be um, made into a new co-op option at all. So if if the telemetry that the server sends to the client indicates 
has some information that goes into the algorithm that determines the probing rate to, for the client that wouldn't I mean that that would be dot specific and that wouldn't in my opinion be need to be in a co-op option but it could just as well be in in the generic um, telemetry that's in there but absolutely yes you know that we, we can we can pick up that kind of stuff we certainly as part of the telemetry we're able to configure uh, what we believe to be the different pipe sizes and so on you know we're on a hundred meg circuit or 50 meg circuit or whatever it may be so we're able to pass that information between the client and the server uh, which helps uh, the mitigation process know that he's only got a 50 meg pipe we can send stuff down everything has to be controlled to that size or whatever it may be we do have the we do have the application layer capable of handling that kind of stuff Certainly, if we had the concept of a block ID, whether it's an e-tag form or block ID form, the client, when he's seeing the block or stuff come back, he can tell if he's missing blocks by the bodies of blocks. He can see that he's only getting one in 10 of them getting in his direction or something, and is able to feed that back up uh, via the DOTS protocol to the server, etc. cetera. Or, uh, that could be something that co-op, if you, if you want to have the Gestion control feedback as part of co-op could be an action. So that, that might be one component of the solution that we essentially define a way for co-op to run with external congestion control input. So the, the co-op machine does not have to itself find all the congestion control information. It gets some some additional information from the application with, which has uh, more more information available uh, to it. So that, that could be one way to, to solve this congestion issue and then we could focus on, on the protocol issues. Any other input on that? Just, just that I, I, I like the separation of kind of doing some doing flow control that's probably dot specific, because that would also free the rest of the discussion of the kind of of, of the of the oddities of the particular situation, and help us get a better generic solution to the rest of the issue. Please, Klaus. I would like to throw in a slightly different perspective. Um, what we have right now is um, co-op over UDP and DTLS, and we have co-op over TCP and TLS. And um, when we started with co-op over UDP 10 years ago, um, we um, tried to keep co-op as simple as possible. And um, what we did in the beginning was um, that we tried to get away with not even having um, confirmable messages and acknowledgements uh, or even specify congestion control for co-op over UDP. And um, some somewhat reluctantly, we put those features in. Um, confirmable messages seemed um, to be a good idea, but of course the cost was that we now had this uh, additional messaging layer between co-op request response and uh, UDP. And um, of course we couldn't get around defining um, congestion control for co-op UDP. And uh, for that we followed the RFC on UDP user guidelines which had um, different recommendations based on if you have round trip times available or not, and so on. And uh, I think we modeled congestion control mostly after the case um, that was called um, low volume applications. And then as Kirsten pointed out, um, 
uh, we, we noticed for some people, this co-op over UDP doesn't work. If you have large payloads, for example, then you might want to have um, something more sophisticated. And um, with co-op over TCP, we have such a solution. And um, so the idea, as, as Carsten said, was if, if you need something more than this simple congestion control, simple retransmissions, just use co-op over TCP. And now, um, 10 years later, uh, things have changed a bit. Um, we're not talking that much uh, anymore about 802.15.4 networks. Um, maybe our constraint devices have also grown a bit and more like uh, Raspberry Pis today than uh, ARM Cortex M0s and so on. And uh, it's always great to see when a protocol can adapt to um, use cases and, and scenarios that weren't envisioned in the beginning. Now, in, in some cases, um, the use cases um, get pretty far away from the initial use case, and, and at some point it starts hurting a bit um, because of, of some initially designed um, limitations. And in, in that case, we have uh, a dilemma, and that dilemma is always, um, if we just add this one tiny thing, then we can support a new use case. But if we add one more tiny thing, and one more tiny thing, and one more tiny thing, then at some point we get further away from the initial design goal of, of having a really simple protocol. If, if you build a web browser, and you think you really need this blinking text, then you just add this one more thing of an HTML tag that blinks your text, and, and you're done. Um, but I think uh, since the name of the working group is the constrained RESTful environments, I think we do not have this luxury here. Um, so even though I desperately want to make co-op useful for more use cases, I'm also always a bit conflicted and uh, think, can we afford this one more tiny thing? And um, my coming back to this um, draft that has been now be presented, um, my initial reaction was that if co-op over UDP is too limiting because it doesn't fit exactly this use case. And uh, co-op over TCP uh, is a no-no and too big. Wouldn't it make sense if we try to build something in between? So if, if we now have requirements like, um, ju just as an example, selective acknowledgments or negative acknowledgments and retransmission windows and uh, dots specific congestion control and, and so on. Wouldn't it be the best solution if uh, we bring this to the transports area? We build something in between UDP and TCP, and then we just define a new co op transport. Co op over dots TP, the dots transport protocol. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, part of the challenge is that we've almost got the, the standard dots uh, protocol definitions, what have you, are just about to hit the final RFC stage. Um, the RFC number's been allocated, but it's not yet published. So it's not that easy to go back and change all that for a um, co-op over X protocol. Where we stumbled into this was the extensions for the telemetry to be able to send large, larger data. Go ahead, Karsten. Yeah, I think what, what uh, Klaus said is, is quite true, uh, but I think it's also about adding features to CoAP that, that become part of the the standard protocol that we would recommend people uh, to use outside the the dots use case i think we we do have a little bit little bit more flexibility uh, in adding things uh, to co-op a couple of new options or something like that a few media types 
that are really designed to be specific uh, to a use case and come with the appropriate warnings, with the appropriate applicability uh, statement that they have not been designed to be uh, used in the general uh, internet except in, in the situations that DOTS is designed to address. Um, so uh, I, I think we, we, we don't have to go back to the drawing uh, board, uh, but of course I'm still interested in, in uh, optimizing this to, to have as much uh, that, that we can take home from, from this exercise for, for the um, more global co uh, community. And uh, um, I also think we, we should not be designing another transport protocol while, while we are doing this and so on. So uh, keeping it simple is, is also a, an important consideration. But uh, in the end, I think it makes sense to build something that, that is useful for DOTS. And uh, if we have to do this uh, in a way that, that cannot be transferred one-to-one -to, -one to other applications, that's also fine. Anyone else wants to uh, voice their opinion? And just to double check, Christian, uh, have you explored uh, in a good way for you the alternative use of non-traditional responses as they are now or can be developed? Um, I didn't really get that question. Uh, have you discussed uh, good enough for you in a good enough uh, way for you the alternative usage of uh, non-traditional responses as they are now or uh, as they can be developed? Um, I, th Man, I, th I think I think that the, the proposals are in the mails. Um, discussing them through is probably not on the agenda for today. And I think that the main part that this is, or the direction this is going is more about the congestion control anyway, and then how to, whether whether one can use non-traditional responses or wants to go block three, four direction, um, doesn't help too much in this discussion. So if, if, the, um, if the outcome of this is that we have an, have something about congestion control and then a block three, four that's maybe updated to not interfere with probing rate, but just state what um, what it can do, then it would be easier to go through another iteration of what non-traditional responses can do for that. Um, I'm, I'm willing to then maybe throw another question to the group, like is the current blockwise transfer is it sufficient for the cases we have as we need to define new block three, block four? Is it worth the while to go back to the drawing board and see how block wise could be updated? Or maybe it's a bit too early. Okay, Carsten. Ah, sorry, I jumped the queue. Uh, I think Mohammed is there, but maybe Carsten, you want to reply to this, I guess. Well, I want to hear what uh, Matt has to say first. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, actually, actually, I wanted just to comment about the um, the, the comment from from Christian about the uh, the problem rate, but um, I think that you 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 will it, it's it's not related to to the question from 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 Jaime, so I can wait until you you finish. Okay, so basically, I think uh, we have uh, uh, identified two things that that hurt here. Um, one is that. Uh, the, the block protocol is entirely lockstep. Uh, so you you have to receive the next request bef before you can 
uh, sent another response. So doing something that, that is somewhat related to observe, but, but is not about observing a resource, but, but is about eliciting the uh, blocks of something, that, that's probably a useful thing to have. And the other thing that I think we have identified is that we need some form of selective acknowledgement uh, mechanism because we, we, we cannot work with, with a, a one acknowledgement packet uh, per uh, data packet situation. So this is kind of the inverse of what I just said, um, that uh, uh, if we can uh, get something like like a bitmap back, uh, which blocks have made it, which which haven't. Um, that would be um, a way to to solve that problem. At least in one direction, I think we already have the selective acknowledgement in that we can work with no non with no response requests. How does that work? Um, I mean, there's. I don't think that there's anything that would stop a client from kind of say putting the first block, then putting a few other blocks in a non-request with no response in the success case, and then put the say tenth or twentieth block in a con again and see whether the server complains or not. Interesting. I think that it would be worth uh, writing this up. Um, it is in the last mail on the in the review mail for the dots case. Okay, I have to read that. So, how how does the the side that is sending the blocks know which ones have arrived? Um, it knows well. In, in the in the end, it will need some pretty. It will need some concrete um, payload in the four dot something. I don't have everything to process this response. Yeah, I, I have, don't quite understand how four dot eight fits into the protocol flow because four dot eight is a final response. Uh, to to a request, so you can't really do much when when you have got that. Can't you? I mean, if if you got a uh, say five or three somewhere in between a block request, you could still try to resume later. So why not on a four or three? I think I need to see a, a, a flesh, fleshed out example for that. I can try that. Yeah, so what I was trying to say is that, that uh, something like, like a SEC uh, for, for this situation, selective acknowledgement for this situation, is exactly what we need. And we essentially have to come up with a data structure uh, that represents that, but we also have to understand how in the protocol flow, uh, 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 how the protocol flow makes use of that uh, data structure. So who sends this, when, why, and so on. And in my opinion, the crop request response layer is the wrong place to do sex. I, I certainly agree with that from from a theoretical protocol purity point of view, um, but I still think it 
we should explore whether it can be done and whether the the shape of what we uh, get is is not just ugly but but has some actual problems that would stop us uh, from using it um i mean sometimes uh, much of the internet is built out of hex like this Yeah, to me it seems uh, that it makes sense to write up some of these uh, flows uh, in, in a little more detail. I, I couldn't quite make out out of new block what the protocol machinery behind these uh, flows was uh, going to be. So maybe if we get a little bit more, more detail uh, into that. Uh, we we could uh, find out whether we can solve it that way. Which for the details, Carson, you are referring to? So how do the two ends of the communication know what they are supposed to do? Do do we have all the the negotiation information? the the uh, proto protocol progress information and so on available that you can actually write code that does this and preferably code that is not entirely different from uh, how you would uh, do a uh, co-op in the first place I haven't done any specific coding with block three, block four, but in terms of the, the coding that I have done that's currently using block one, block two, um, I don't see any challenges in there. As, as I said, in terms of the block four, providing the client sends the block four to the server, he knows that block support is available and therefore he can uh, remove lock step requirements to send blocks and he can just send the set of blocks in a sequential chain and then go into the recovery after that i haven't been thinking through because i know the new block stuff um draft that came along it has been modified a little bit from our new block discussions based on the new block discussions and thinking things further through from a coding perspective um block three block four draft is coming to but i don't expect any coding issues um that require anything else to be changed in co-op other than the support of the, this particular option There, there were a few uh, break statements about uh, tokens and so on that I, I couldn't quite understand. Okay, so yeah, it, it's it's really is um, when one needs to provide a token, then we had discussions about empty tokens and so on. But the token that is provided on a block four, a set of block four, should it be the same token, which is what's controlled by the client, or should it be individually generated tokens randomly, which is against the whole spirit of things, which is why in the uh, block three, block four draft, I had them all at the same token as be having the same token to kind of remove that ambiguity there. So that it, it followed how existing co-op type stuff does things. Namely the client initiates a request, there is a token, he then gets back 10, 20, 30 block fours, which make up a body all with the same token, and he can assimilate them back into the same response. So the, the extended lifetime of the token would be a lot like the way Observe uh, uses Correct. Uh, tokens. Yes. But then we also need to understand when the token finally is retired. Yes. Um, well, the, the token is finally, re um, okay, so if, if the, when the get request is done, he uses a token, at which point the responses come back with all the blocks. If the get request doesn't observe at the same time, or initiates a reserve at the same time, then the token is remembered by the server, 
for a period of time that the observe lasts for. And there is a possibility that the client will be cycling through lots of requests and hence lots of tokens. Uh, there's a potential clash with what's sitting there as part of the observe. But we have the same situation just even with single packet observes coming back. There's no difference there in terms of as to what we're doing. We'll have that potential same clash. I wouldn't phrase that as a clash, more as a situation where the client is running out of usable tokens. Fair enough, yeah. You, I am not a wordsmith. You guys are. Yes, I agree. How do you do that? Uh, with difficulty. But it's it's the, the, the client just needs to know that he's uh, that he's asked for lots, of, he's using his tokens and that he has an outstanding token being used for outstanding observe requests. So the client should know and maintain tokens for this list of this is a list of tokens for this list of observe requests that he's done. So when the whenever the appropriate observe response comes back, he knows what to associate it with. So he's he will be maintaining a list of tokens which are already allocated against observes. he just uses other tokens for his other requests over time. Right. Um, so it's hard to run out of tokens because there, there are two to the power 64 uh, of those. Yes, agreed. So maybe I, I didn't understand what, what the point was. Uh, the, the, of course, you, you, you need to keep track of your outstanding requests. Um, so the, 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 there is no way around that. And, and storing a token with the outstanding uh, request uh, shouldn't be too hard. Correct. The question really is, when, when do you actually retire a request? Um, okay, well, we, we by and large, we use observe, and so it's retiring the observe. But in terms of uh, when a request retires, okay, so we send off a request, and there are 10 blocks that can come back, and if we have all those 10 have the same token, we may get nine of them back because of a lost environment. We can either re-request the missing 10th item, or we can say we're going to ignore any further responses coming back. We use that token for other purposes. But the difference is that the request, a single request with the token, we may get back multiple responses for case without observe with the same token. I guess that's, that's the difference. That is a difference. the block four is coming back and we'll see that it's a block four option in the buried in the middle there somewhere and so we'll know that we're in a block four situation and are expecting more of the blocks to come back right and uh, the the request that would be sent out to get the rest of the blocks i would say needs to use a different token that it follows the standard co-op rules that if there is a subsequent request in the same way that we have block two has a subsequent request from the client he uses a different token okay Yeah, I at least think this can be made to work. It, it may not be beautiful, but uh, um, yeah. So what my problem really probably is more with the the current text that doesn't explain all the things that that we uh, seem to to have in mind here. Sure. Well, certainly, Med and I will go back and revisit the draft based on the discussions we've had today, and come up with um, again more documenting some of the uh, the sequencing and so on as well as a bit more clarity as to who uses what where and how okay so we we probably need this applicability statement we need uh, some way of saying there is congestion control information outside of co-op that that goes into this uh, process 
we, we need the definitions of the block three and block four options, and we need the data structure that uh, does the selective acknowledgement or the selective re-request. Yes. I think that's the list of things I have in mind right now. Some of this information is already in the draft, but we, we will rework them to uh, to make them more clear. So, Christian, what do you think about what I just said? I still think that it would be more elegant to solve this by um, this by just using a more generic um, phrasing of non-traditional responses. But if it's kind of, if, if it turns out that that is more complicated and slower, and this is just what we need for this very particular use case, yeah. Yeah, so I think we should simply true, by, true both in parallel. So do the, the very, very specific, very limited uh, solution, uh, but also think about um, uh, a solution that, that has more, more, more uh, has a broader scope of applicability. And uh, at some point we need to decide which of these we actually do. So how much time can we give ourselves for doing that? That was mostly a question in the direction of, of the dots people. Okay, in terms of time, in terms of the block three, block four stuff, a um, couple of weeks max, I would expect less than that. In terms of the uh, non-traditional responses, um, I need to think quite a bit about that because that is more kind of unsolicited non-traditional responses in that the server can elect to send something because he feels like it, for whatever reason, rather than, um, it's it's kind of, there's, there's an element of observe in there, in that you, see, if something happens, then you've got to send this data. But it doesn't, at the moment, in my mind, I need to go back and reread it again, it doesn't really cover um, multiple blocks of data. Unless you view it as being unsolicited, block one, block two, block three of 10 getting sent as a non-traditional response. What, what, what do you mean by it doesn't cover multiple blocks of data? Well, in that it, it's, it just, it talks about, you know, there's, it, there is this response where we have embedded in there, this is what the request would have looked like had you requested it, and here's the response uh, type stuff. That, that, that would not be necessary for the block responses. No, okay. Because they're, they are obviously non-matching. Yeah, but the, then for the, okay, so, Sending multiple blocks is we blocks. We can have the initial block two is sent, and then we can have mm -hmm. non-traditional responses, which are the remaining block twos. Mm -hmm. They would be subject to any probing rate type stuff, because you're sending them out and you're not necessarily getting a response back, and therefore you don't know whether you're killing the network by overload or whatever. So there's, there's all that kind of congestion control discussion is also relevant to that there. Um, yeah, but I think that can be independent. I mean, that's that that should really be independent of of which block option one does this with, because this one is an option and the other is is kind of the 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 request response, uh, the 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 act and uh, act and con layer of coop. Yeah. Okay. I, I need I need to go back and look at the non traditional one and think about it, how we can take that or extend it in the direction of mm -hmm. um, the, the specific problem we're trying to solve. So, so one, one thing that I'd like to, to add here is that if, for example, picking, um, sending a single, um, if giving more indication to the server about what blocks the client wants is something that you'll need, you'd need, this can be added. But one of the design points for this uh, um, 
for this leisure for for this additional for this new option that allows the server to send more leisure for responses option is that all those op those kind of specifications like send me this and that and that block or then no if there is a link over there follow it and give me that response as well could be done in such a way that the proxy doesn't necessarily need to understand them sure so i didn't add them in there because that's kind of the generic framework but something like and give me slices from two as well can be an option that i didn't write about yet okay so it, yeah it's um you have things that you've thought about that i'm coming in from the cold and haven't yet even thought about but yes yeah. I certainly, I'm, I'm happy to take away and look at the non-traditional response stuff and see whether it can be extended in directions that make sense for the challenge we have with dots, which is to get uh, large blocks of data over, but we don't care too much if they actually get lost. So, uh, I'm, I'm also happy to kind of update that more frequently. Um, procedurally, I don't really know where, where to do this best right now. I've written a mail um, because it's basically updating a draft that's not mine or suggesting an update to a draft that's not mine. Um, it would just help me if Carsten and or Klaus, one of you could have a brief, just high level look at the non-traditional response proposal, because if I'm going in a completely wrong direction, you'd probably spot that. Well, I looked at it and uh, I was going to ask whether you want to be a co-author. Um, happily so. So, yeah, the, my, my question actually was not so much about how long do we need to do this work, but how much time do we have to do this work? So, what, what, is the DOTS universe going to explode on, on August 31st if, if we don't have that this solution defined? or um, do we have a year or uh, what, what is the, of course, everybody wants everything as soon as possible. I understand that. But what, what is the realistic timeline for this? Mm, it, it depends if you want to, to have this included in the base and uh, telemetry uh, specification, which is currently, I would say, it's, it's advanced in the, I would say, uh, in the, um, the version we, we we have we have so far uh, my target for it is to is to have it in the working of last call by uh, mid July. So um, for for the time being, I'm really careful to um, despite that we we and we we know that this is really a, I would say a problem that we we need to solve. Uh, so far, we are careful in the usage of the I would say there is no normative I would say language for pointing to um, the, the the blocks we we have defined so far. Um, so for me, I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to to add any, I would say, any dependency on on the um, the telemetry specifications on something that I am not sure I will get soon. So um, perhaps we we can manage to have an, um, I would say, an update to the dust telemetry itself if we are confident that we will, I would say carry on the um, the two uh, the, the two tracks and then decide whether we need to to um whether we maintain the uh, the um the proposal with the blocks or the one um uh, about the unsolicited responses that can be another I would say another uh, um an, another track to, to to investigate but ideally i wanted to have something which can be integrated in the dot telemetry and i thought that we have done what, what we have done with the block specification is really i would say more focused and can be i would say um uh, um, progress in the publication process faster than the unsolicited specification itself. Um, so it's really up to, uh, I, I don't have, I would say, sorry to, to not be, I would say, more precise on term of, I would say, on the, um, on, on the milestone, but yes, this is, this is the, um, the, 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 the current, the current situation is that we have a specification which, which, which advanced. Um, we, we have this pending issue about the, I would say, the, um, the uh, the uh, the large notification notifications. Um, ideally, we, we would like to have the the blocks 
I would say, option specified, but I understand that the working group, the co-working group will take more time to, I would say, to compare, I would say, the, the, the various proposals and then to, uh, to, to make a decision. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's it won't be the end of the world if we don't have this this uh, issue. Um, I would say frozen in the in the current specification. What what I can have, what I can do by by July is that if I don't see any progress on this front, I would just declare it as an, an open issue and uh, say that the the current telemetry specifications won't solve that, and this is for future uh, uh, version of the specification. So that's uh, that's uh, my current take on this. Okay, thank you. That that was a very detailed answer to my question. I think I understand the situation. So I think we we have about six weeks we can use to to play Lego with our various uh, elements of solutions we have in mind, and then I think uh, we should uh, start should be starting to make decisions. Uh, Mohammed, before you also had some comments on the probing rate itself. You yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, for other words, yeah, the comment I wanted to make is that we actually we are when we are uh, opening the I would say the session between the DOS client and the DOS server, we are negotiating also the the probing rate that will be followed by both the the DOS agents. So um, we we are we are increasing the 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 default one that we have currently in co-op we are, we are recommending to use a five because we there are um, a lot of overheads there but once we agreed on i would say the problem rate between the dot client and the dot servers we are adhering to that problem rate so we are not being aggressive to what is negotiated on configuration we are bypassing that that congestion control in one exception when there is an uh, an attack and we want to to plus a mitigation request Apart from that, we are really, I would say, following the um, the uh, the average, which is which is dictated by the problem rate, and we are also following the recommendation we have in RFC uh, 80, 85, uh, 5. So we we are not bombing the, I would say, the network, and we are not just sending messages to, to the network that the network is able to to handle. Uh, this is the first comment about the problem rate. Um, there, there is also one comment that the question made by my question about if whether we have a, a feedback from the agents themselves about they are receiving, I would say, some messages. Um, as mentioned by, by John, we are defining at the application level what we call the herbits, and the, the herbits we we are including, uh, I would say, an information um, about the the herbits which is received from the other peers. That's I'm saying that's yes, I'm alive and I am receiving or I am not receiving any Herbert from you. So we are also sending a feedback to, to the other agents in the Herbert application itself. So this can be, if there is, for instance, if there is a congestion, that means that in one direction you, go, you, are, you will be able to send your Herberts to the, the other agents, but you don't receive any ones from, from the other ones. So the, the agent which, which sent the Herberts that are lost is aware the, about the loss because it is also reported by the the the, uh, the destination agent. So we have this elementary information which is shared between the the client and the server. This is not sufficient for I would say managing all the the situation, but this is what we have in uh, currently in the specifications. Okay, the, the probing rate negotiation is part of the uh, document that already went through the ISG, right? Yeah. Okay, so we, we don't have to renegotiate that part with the ISG. I think that that's a useful uh, part. And, and having the heartbeats uh, uh, for additional congestion control information, we would have to check whether that's, that's enough of a measurement uh, to use here. Uh, but uh, yeah, so for, for for the under attack situation, you want to have at least a little bit of information about uh, whether the data flow do flow in the non attacked direction. Exactly. The, the heartbeats might provide that information. So it's a bit like a receiver report in in RTP. If you need to explain that.
Yeah. So at, at the protocol level, uh, at the current protocol level, we don't really have to do much. We just say that there is external input uh, that, that allows us to um, uh, do this in a proper way. And uh, we just uh, make sure we stay within those limits uh, provided by the external input. So I think we, we are pretty safe. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, th this has to be written up somewhere, uh, probably in, in the DOTS uh, document. Yeah, we, 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 in, the, um, in the next revision of the draft, we will add, I would say, the applicability that you have mentioned earlier and also this kind of detail so that this can be uh, clearly, I would say, visible in the document. Sounds good to me. Maybe a, the question of curiosity, in the current implementations, how do you actually pace sending these nonce? Well, you, you're talking about with the DOTS implementations. Yes, so so if, if you're doing something like, like block three, block four, uh, you have a number of nuns, you non conformal messages uh, you can send. And how do you know how fast you should send them? How do you manage that? Um, okay, so I, I was going to be sending them like I would send, or I would expect at the transport layer, a fragmented IP packet gets sent. Oh. They just, they just get sent serially one after another at the IP fragment rate. You know, it's like an IP fragmented packet. I hadn't thought about um, actually putting any delays in between the individual blocks. Well, that's probably needed if you want to have a reasonable delivery rate. Okay, so that's maybe something that, that also uh, should be addressed because essentially the probing rate uh, gives you the pace for that. Um, As an average overall, yes. So there'll be a set of blocks, and then there'll be a big think and another set of blocks, and the average will be across um, blocks as they're sent. So that you know the next set of blocks can't be sent until the probing rate's down enough for the next one to be sent. How, how big are these things? Um, I have seen in my tests I've got up to about five packets, but it could be larger. We're, well, we have done some active uh, data reduction to try and reduce the amount of data by having pre-negotiated mapping tables as part of the telemetry information so that we can actually reduce the amount of telemetry data that gets passed across. Uh, as I say, we're, we're, my test is showing about sort of five packets at the moment. We're not likely to go above 10, 15, maybe max. That would yeah. be extreme. So I think the, the argument can be made that in the internet today, you can send 10 packets without any pacing yep. uh, because the, the initial window 10 discussion has pretty much opened that flood, floodgate already. Um, so I think if, if we have a way to uh, make sure we stay within that ballpark, uh, you don't need much, much uh, mechanism. Yeah, if if you occasionally go beyond that, then you still probably have to do some uh, pacing. So I, I think that's unlikely, and we certainly have the ability within the telemetry protocol to do queries, which can do data production. Yeah. Okay, when when do we do the next of, of these things? So this was a pretty useful meeting, I think. Flexible courtesy of Mr. COVID. So, Christian, what do you think? How long do we take to explore the non traditional response world? Um, 
it's it's hard to tell, but I think that we can come up with something solid within the next uh, two or three weeks. So maybe we should target the 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 interim in four weeks from now. Yeah, let's do that. That'd be great. Yep, works for me. Great. Thank you. So overall, John Mohammed, you have enough material for a good revision of the document, I think. And in parallel, the non-traditional responses work can also proceed. Resume and proceed. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank yes. Uh, okay. I think we are done with this meeting today. And thank you all for attending and talk to you in two weeks. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.